Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your patience. I'm Tom Tomich, the director of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute and a faculty member here. And today we have one of our Agricultural Sustainability Institute Distinguished Speaker Series speakers. And I'm really very pleased to introduce Ricardo Salvador, who's just getting himself organized here. Um, Ricardo just, just drove in from Berkeley. And he's going to be speaking on the topic of creating a food utopia from food dystopia, what needs to happen. So I imagine that's why we had such a great turnout, right? That's, we all want to make this happen. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Ricardo as we're getting the slides up. Um, he has a background in agronomy. He has a, a doctorate in crop production and, and physiology from Iowa State University was a faculty member in agronomy at Iowa State. Then, something I just learned, you were you worked in extension in Texas. Yeah. 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 So the, the two states were always looking over our shoulder from California or Iowa and Texas, actually. Uh, and then I, I met Ricardo uh, during the time that he was a program officer with the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, you know, there, there are many uh, ties between our institute and the Kellogg Foundation, including our Kellogg Chair in Sustainable Food Systems and also uh, an endowment from the foundation which Ricardo worked with us on for our national network on food, agriculture, and sustainability. And then uh, just about a year ago, Ricardo moved from Kellogg Foundation to the Union of Concerned Scientists and he's the director and senior scientist in their food and environment program. So Ricardo's gonna talk for about an hour or so um, I imagine it's a fairly complicated story, so if you could let him get through that, we'll still have about a half an hour then for, for discussion afterwards. So, Ricardo, welcome back to Davis. Thank you. Okay, so I uh, want to thank you for being patient, as Tom said. And uh, I've got the mother of all excuses. So at 1217, I was sitting at Saul's in Berkeley, paying for the bill with Michael Pollan. And uh, as you can imagine, that was a diff difficult conversation to draw away from. Uh, so I want to talk to you uh, about a topic that, as Tom has said, is a complicated story. And one of the reasons why it's a complicated story, thank you, Tom is that I imagine that we live in uh, a corner of the world where many probably believe that we already have a food dystopia. So what does it mean uh, to claim that we have a food dystopia and that we could even improve the food system? And so I want to address that first. I guess I have to stay within range of this thing here. Okay, so there we go. So, um, one of the difficulties in addressing this topic is that often we get, um, I think, classified as folks that are um, unrealistic about what is possible with the food system when we talk about an imagined food system that is better. And we talk about regional food systems, and we talk about farmers markets and CSAs, and if you are a partisan or an advocate of any of these alternatives to the uh, fast food model uh, or the industrial food model, uh, immediately you have to counter questions such as, well, is that going to provide the food demand for uh, the planet? And so I, I want to address that from the outset, and I see that I may actually have to just yell at you. That's fine. Can you all hear me if I speak? Okay, great. So I don't even have to bother with that. So, uh, so let me address that, and, and let's just recognize the um, reality about the food system, namely being that it's global in nature. And I wonder, can we dim just the front of the lights or some of the lights in here? So that, that's good enough right there. That way you don't mess up the camera people. Um, so the reason why some of us can realistically believe that we live in a food utopia is if you think about it, you can just eat whenever you want. And something like this for most of us. So you have a class break, or you're going to meet somebody, and you're hungry. And you look down your watch, and you calculate. You say, well, let's see, 
going to be there in 20 minutes. So what do I feel like? Mexican, Thai, Korean? And I've got 20 minutes to do that. And no matter what it is that you answer, for the majority of us in this country, no matter where we are, even here in Davis, California, you can actually, within that span of time, find it. You can get it within minutes of just having thought of it. And so that means whether it's local to where you are when you have that thought, when you get hungry. That means whether it's in season or not. And so what that tells us then is that there's a powerful logistical system that is in place that allows for that to happen. So we get our food in two different places, primarily, just generalizing grossly. So one is that we basically walk into a place where everyone uh, basically is there to take care of our needs. And so you sit down, you just give an opinion about what you want, and it appears on your table. So you don't have to worry about where it's coming from. You don't have to worry about how it's prepared. You just eat it. And when you're done, you don't have to clean up or worry with what's going to happen uh, with the leftovers. You just eat it. And the other half of the time, again, generalizing grossly, we basically go to a grocery store or some other retail outlet of components, not even usually uh, actual uh, food, but components that we can assemble, usually in that magical period of something like about five minutes to 20 minutes at the outside is what we will devote to preparing our meal. 20 minutes is a lot. And so when you put it together, both of these actually are emblematic of a couple of things. One is a global system that actually makes sure that there's a supply chain that gets you whatever it is that you might need, whenever it is that you feel like you want to have it, at a price that you can afford. And that is a major accomplishment. That's the aspect of the system that many folks would say is already food utopia. You can have whatever you want. You don't have to know anything about it. You can just desire it and it appears. Now that's one thing. The other thing that this tells you, this reality tells you, is that you are very powerful. And I know that you may not feel very powerful, particularly those of you that are very young and are in the, uh, in, at the height of your college career. But the power that I'm referring to here is literally the power to command the energy flows of the planet, to reshape the materials of the planet, to turn them into edible bites, actual food system term, that appear within desire's reach, another food system term, so that you just have to worry about what you want to eat. And within five to 10 minutes, you can have it. So not everyone has that power. As a matter of fact, at the outside, there's probably about maybe two billion of us on this planet that have something like that power. And let me be very specific about that power. That's political economic power, to have access to those resources and have them flow to us, literally flow to us. Whether we're going to use them or not, they're flowing to us just in case you might want a pizza. So that's the reality of the present system. So you might say to yourself, I mean, it would be a realistic uh, or an understandable thing to say, what, what is the problem with that? It actually can be viewed as a tremendous success story. And as a matter of fact, I'll pile on. Uh, I'll actually say this was a tremendous success story because it was designed. It was actually intentional. So even though we don't need to be aware what's behind that food system, other people have been working very hard in order to create the reality of that food system. You can, if you just are ever forced to think about it for maybe two or three seconds, you can sort of realize or visualize what is behind it. So obviously someplace this stuff is being produced. And then from production, that material needs to be processed and in some way it's fashioned into that uh, edible bite. And then it's transported to the point where you're actually going to have access to it. And then you're there just saying, this is what I feel like right now. I feel like a salami sandwich right now. And again, without having to worry about anything, it shows up. And so that logistical system that is behind that is a system that in the United States creates about 20 million jobs. So the likelihood of lots of people is involved in being able to provide that food utopia. And it's in all of these different activities. And uh, so this is not the place to get into uh, all of them. Uh, this activity, in addition, uh, is profitable to the extent that it contributes positively to the nation's balance of trade. And it is, in fact, in this nation where the model that you see uh, in a caricature form here was actually developed. And the world over, we're falling over ourselves to imitate this logistical system for accomplishing the purposes that I just described. And so what it gives us is a lot of choice. So there are about 600,000 manufactured products at the moment 
when you walk into a grocery store, there's about 50,000 of them that you can choose from. The majority of them are actually in constant churn. There's actually very few of them that are the winners that are there, you know, constantly, the major name brands that you might be accustomed to. What you see here is an example of real estate business because the stuff that is right at eye level as you walk in has been paid for so that it's placed just so that you get the idea that you might want that. And so it's, it's a highly developed business with lots of norms and practices that uh, regiment the way that it operates, but it does state your needs. <coughs> Here's another important attribute of the system. If you walk into the world's largest grocer, which you'll recognize by the color, uh, another thing that you'll experience about this food system is that it explains why it is that you don't feel particularly powerful, even though what I've described is probably the greatest power that any single individual human being has had in all of the existence of humanity on the planet. It used to be that only royalty commanded that sort of privilege, and not even to the degree that the least of us in this room does at the moment. I mean, think about it. If you want an Eskimo pie, you can have that. Within five minutes, I guarantee you, from where we're sitting right now. That's tremendous political economic power to be able to, to do that. So that's my theme, as you can pick up. And here's the uh, price of that. You've all seen uh, this illustration. So this is what we expend per household on average in the United States tracked across time. And so here's the other victory story about this uh, food system. This is expressed as percentage of household income. And you see that essentially then we've been whittling away at this so that now it is less than 10%. So you've often heard the, the statistic in lots of different ways. My guess is one of the ways in which you hear it most frequently is in a Kant. Uh, it's actually the doxology of the food system. And the moment you begin to hear the first line, you can all finish it with me. And it is that the United States possesses the most productive, the most abundant, safest, most affordable food supply in the world. You recognize that doxology of the food system. And so here, I mean, it's not fiction. Here's a statistic that shows that we expend very little of what we earn in order to exert that tremendous political power globally. Because this, this applies to anything that you can name. Again, I'll repeat, whether it's produced in the United States or not, whether it's in season in the United States or not, you can command a global flow of that just in case you might need it. Now, there's an economic principle behind that. That is that really it isn't just you that's doing that. A lot of us have to actually be having that desire in order for this to actually be, be possible. So we'll get to that aspect uh, of the story in just a little bit. But this, again, is just tremendous advantage to the system. And I claim it's a design system. So this is a tremendous success story. So in order to explain how it's a design system, I'll pick up just one particular thread. I think it's a particularly dominant part of the thread, uh, but I'll acknowledge that there's other parts of the, of the story. And that is that it always, of course, has not been this way. Um, as a matter of fact, there are probably a few individuals of age in this room who can remember a time when it was not that way, when you couldn't just desire whatever you want and have it within five to 20 minutes. And uh, as a matter of fact, so that's a, a generation, uh, a lifetime that I'm describing. In the 1860s, no one could have imagined that sort of a system. In the 1860s, the majority of the country expended the majority of their time, energy, and preoccupation in answering the question, how are we going to eat? And so some of us specialized in producing the stuff. Some of us specialized in processing it and storing it. It occupied the majority of our waking hours. And so I'm going to tell you the story of how the system was designed. Again, just one particular thread. It comes from somebody that spent hours and hours at the sharp end of a team of horses uh, who you can just obviously tell when you hear the individual's reasoning asked himself during those long hours a question like this, isn't there a better way than this? And so I'll, I'll illustrate this just a little bit. Now you'll, you'll recognize the uh, besides here, I'm guessing. And, uh, normally you wouldn't, but uh, this has received a lot of media coverage lately because of uh, documentaries and movies. So this is an individual you all would recognize immediately. And so uh, what I want to do is just read you some passages from a speech that Abraham Lincoln gave at the Wisconsin State Fair the year before he was elected to the presidency uh, for his first term. Um, and uh, so, you know, you'll have to humor me here because this will seem really dry. So first of all, the man is running a campaign. 
the Wisconsin State Fair, you know, normally the State Fair is predominantly farmers, but at that time, everybody in the population was farmers. So he first acknowledges, his, you all are farmers. And then he says, and I'm not going to pander to you, which is kind of an unusual political <laughs> move, you know, when you're running for president. Uh, and then he begins to get into what I consider to be very deep, profound, um, philosophical questions about what agriculture is. And so let me give you uh, uh, some samples of this. So uh, he says, for instance, um, my first suggestion is an inquiry as to the effect of greater thoroughness, today we might say efficiency, in all the departments of agriculture that now prevails in the Northwest. So he's speaking in Wisconsin at that time, that is the Northwest. And he says, perhaps I might say in America, and then he asks this question, what would be the effect upon the farming interest to push the soil up to something near its full capacity? At that time, that's an open question. What can you actually produce? Unquestionably, it will take more labor to produce 50 bushels from an acre than it will to produce 10 bushels from that same acre, so five-fold productivity. But will it take more labor to produce 50 bushels from one acre than from five? So he's talking about intensification of production and what it will take to provide the resources. Today we would say the thermodynamics to make that possible, to make that intensification possible. So within two sentences, he's talking some pretty deep agricultural engineering. There are, today there are whole departments on this campus. There's a whole department dedicated just to that question. And then he says, unquestionably, thorough cultivation will require more labor to the acre, but will it require more to the bushel? So again, that's the concept of efficiency. If it should require just as much to the bushel, there are some probable and several certain advantages in favor of the thorough practice of, of the greater efficiency. <coughs> now, um, I'm gonna skip a whole sentence or a whole paragraph here where he essentially just riffs off of that particular theme. Uh, but let me get to another point here where he talks about a, a different area and he says, um, after he talks about the, the amount of energy that it takes for a horse to drag a machine through the field and wonders about the efficiency of feed conversion in the horse and how far that horse can get from the source of feeding uh, while generating work, he then changes uh, topics and he says, it is plain that when the crop is very thick upon the ground, the larger proportion of the power is directly applied to gathering in and cutting it and the smaller to that which is totally useless as an end. Here he's talking about weeds, which at that time were a reality in all cropping. And so he was saying, it, you're expending the same amount of energy, energy, but some of it is for stuff you're actually going to thresh and turn into bread, and some of it is not going to be used for anything. And so that's what he means when he says, to that which is totally useless as an end. And what I have said harvesting, and harvesting is true, in a greater or less degree of mowing, plowing, gathering, and of crops generally, and indeed of almost all farm work. So uh, when I said you were going to humor me, you can see what I meant. But let me translate that. What, what it, in essence, he has specified is all the departments of a modern college of agriculture. So there's a department of agricultural engineering, a department of crop production, a department of soil science. In some campuses, there's a separate department of soil fertility. Sometimes those two are combined. Um, there is a department of wheat science, just specifically focused on that notion that he calls the greater thoroughness. And of course, the difference between this particular individual and the hundreds of thousands of others who labored behind teams of horses or oxen was that he was in a position to do something about that eventually. And so let's talk about what he did. Actually, one of the things that he did was make it possible for you to be sitting in this room right now. And the reason for that is that as soon as he became president, uh, he began setting up establishments. One of these was the United States Department of Agriculture. At that time, you improved agriculture by finding better seeds. And at that time, that was done by someone sitting over in the patent office. That was where there was actually file cabinets of different sorts of seeds that were <coughs> traded as treasure. But he set up the United States Department of Agriculture to pursue these questions scientifically, and he set up an entire nationwide system, which you now know as a land grant system, that was being emblematic of these uh, campuses, with all of these different departments and specializations that I described. This was systematic thinking. What, what we have now was something that he foresaw. It was not accidental. He designed it, that there would be knowledge that would inform what he called the greater practice or the thorough practice. Now notice the dates here. This man had other preoccupations on his mind at the time that he's setting up these institutions. The year following, he set up the National Academy of Sciences. 
you all know the ambitious goal of this institution was to provide certain information uh, to Congress so that Congress could make decisions on factual data. That was the purpose of the National Academy of, of Sciences. So these are just some of the institutions that, that uh, Lincoln established. And now, listen, we're going to be unfair to the story, but basically fast forward the outcomes of setting certain things in motion. So those are initial conditions. Um, shortly after that period of time, there was, or around that period of time, actually, there was the joining of the intercontinental railways, which essentially made time disappear. It made it possible to utilize new technologies such as steam engines to provide traction over the ground. Those uh, carriages on railroads, you could actually refrigerate so that then you could store perishables and make time disappear, transport them all over the place. Um, in the 30s, the phenomenon that we still don't understand of heterosis was discovered and exploited commercially. We know how to manipulate it, even though we don't understand it fundamentally. During the Second World Wars, we actually learned to apply logistics on a global scale. And lots of the technologies developed during those wars actually turned into agricultural technology. Bombing technology, primarily around uh, how you fix nitrogen, eventually became the fertilizer uh, industry. Uh, certain chemical warfare agents turned into pesticides uh, in the post-world era. So we learned how to operate global logistics. We learned how to manipulate chemicals to pr uh, produce specific effects. We learned to make time disappear. We began to manipulate our world to meet our needs. And we established a tremendous industrial plant in order to make all of this possible, because we did this through, as I mentioned <coughs> earlier, using the world's flows of energy to reshape the world's materials to meet human needs. So when all of that came together, it produced this. So I, I want to, uh, first of all, point out that this is a nice proxy for the industrial food system. You may think, sitting out here in Davis, even though this particular county is actually a major uh, corn producer in California as a whole, you might think, well, this is a Midwestern story of corn and soy. Um, this is a nice proxy for the industrial food system. Um, how, how many of you, my guess is being on a university campus, I've got a lot of Trekkies here, science fiction geeks. Anybody? So how, how many of you can explain the food replicator on the Starship Enterprise? <laughs> Do you have any that are that deep into this? So you know the, the food replicator, you, uh, you walk up to the food replicator, which is on, the, on a panel, and you speak with it. You know, so the series all news by the time. And so you, you say, I feel like uh, chicken parmesan. And in the whole of the Starship Enterprise, there is this paste. And that paste has been formulated to meet all human nutritional requirements, but it's just a paste. And the moment you say, I feel like Parmesan, whoop, 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 it gets shaped into the shape of uh, chicken Parmesan, and it gets texturized, you know, the right flavors, the right moisture, all of that is added, and then it's shipped up to you, and you open the little glass pane, and you have your chicken Parmesan. You never know anything better. It's just been <coughs> manufactured for you on order. And we're actually not that far from now. Any time that you need yeah. uh, Pringles and sip on your Coke, do those sorts of things, eat something that's called buffalo wings. That's exactly what you're doing. The stuff doesn't exist. It's been manufactured. You okay. ask for it and it appears for it the second that you ask for it. And it's made from all this stuff. So, uh, you know, the, the soy produces stuff that essentially is used to moisturize and texturize, uh, get things to bind uh, in these manufactured foods. The corn, as you know, is literally uh, in everything, even in that Coke that I mentioned. It sweetens it, it provides the fizz, the carbon dioxide is generated from the fermentation of starches that come out of the corn. So I won't belabor that particular point, but this is a nice proxy for the industrial food system. And it became possible when all of those factors that I described earlier set in motion by the institutions and the processes that Lincoln uh, created in the 1860s, finally all combined in the post world era when we had learned through the Second World Wars how to operate global logistics, we get this explosion. Now, I want to call your attention to this period right here where it looks like nothing's happening. And the interesting thing about that period of time is that you notice that there's a great deal of variability. Now, there is a great deal of variability post that, you know, so this is not misdirection. It's just that there's another story that's happening simultaneously, and that is bountiful production. Before that, there's just a lot of variability and unpredictability. And at that time, what that meant, notice the productivity levels over there on the left-hand side. At that time, what that meant is you either uh, had famine or you had surplus that you had to worry how to extract value from before the stuff actually spoiled on you with the rats got it. 
So this was a serious problem at a time when, remember, the majority of the population is rural. The majority of the population is out on the farm. And beginning in the 1930s, uh, actually not as a result of any initiative in Washington, D.C., but as a result of heightened populist pressure out throughout the majority of that population, the government began to fiddle with federal policies to try to stabilize that situation. As a matter of fact, one of the first acts uh, that was passed to try to deal with this was called the Agricultural Stabilization uh, Act and Conservation Act there in the 1930s. So the interesting thing about the system that was put into place after that, and this is very, very important for us to understand at present, was how to deal with surplus. In order for you to establish effective federal policies to deal with stabilizing agriculture, what you have to do is have surplus. That, that provides the buffer that's necessary for you to work with. Obviously, you're not going to stabilize at a point where you're going to be having production at less than what you need at a time when there isn't global trade for these sorts of things. And so, surplus is one of the key goals, extra productivity. But it's a key goal for a number of different reasons. You actually do need additional production for the growing population. And so, let me summarize very quickly the experimentation because that's essentially what it has been in federal policy that has created the system that we have right now. You can imagine the present system is one that essentially exists within an envelope that is defined by federal policies that tell us what the rule of the food system are. The incentives and the disincentives that shape the food system, by and large, were shaped through policies like the ones that we're going to summarize here. First part of the story is a huge land grab, sort of like the ones that you read about in the headlines about Africa today. It dates all the way back to the time of Jackson and the so-called Indian Removal Act that essentially made a lot of the land in the Midwest that became today's breadbasket, quote, available to the colonizing population as it moved westward. That was a federal policy that made that land available. And then in 1862, this is another one of the institutions that Lincoln put in place, the Homestead uh, Act. So in essence, if you invested in improving a plot of land, 160 acres, uh, for a minimum period of time, five years, then this plot of land would be yours. You were deeded uh, that as your own property. And so that, excuse me, vast swaths of the Midwest in various episodes were populated by farming, uh, by farming populations uh, in this way. Now, this is not the place really to get into the wonky aspects of uh, all of the different versions of major agricultural bills. So let me just summarize by telling you what we were experimenting with at the time. So first of all, the generation of surplus. And then, after the security of the food supply was established, answer the question, what to do with surplus? And how do you manage the supply? Do you manage the supply? Do you manage the demand? What is the best role when you're going to be intervening in the market? Because from the very first, with the Agricultural Adjustment Act, you won't be able to see this uh, the small lettering there. But essentially, a cartoon from the time says that the Farm Relief Bill is actually rolling all over uh, the capitalist system. So at the time, it was very clear that this government intervention in the market was something that was very controversial. But remember, what's driving this is populist pressure from a population that is primarily rural, and the government has as an objective improving the well-being of its rural population. And so another question that needs to be solved is, well, once you figure out how these programs work, uh, this is uh, the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act from 1936 when you can incentivize hundreds of thousands of farmers to follow federal edict. Um, is it fair to ask farmers, you remember the, the um, tremendous environmental challenges of the 30s, um, to conserve in exchange for receiving government support to stabilize their economies? And that's still a question that's actually in full debate. The answer to the question right now happens to be no. It's not fair to ask farmers to conserve natural resources. It's not natural uh, patrimony. It's private property. And further experimentation goes along the lines of, well, what if farmers begin to game the system? We're all humans. So what if we decide to jump into federal programs when prices are low, but jump out when the market is better? and begin to exploit the system that way. So you begin to get requirements for having what are now termed base acres, consistent economic activity with a particular crop over a period of time, demonstrable productivity, productivity so that it's clear that you're making earnest efforts at produ producing on that land. Um, once you get into the era where you're trying to deal with what to do with the surplus, and this is a, a very a little mentioned aspect of the story, that this has always been about the question, what do you do with your 
tremendous productive capacity, not only of the natural resources of the nation, but of its entrepreneurs. We've been producing more than necessary since that period of time. And variously, I mean, you know uh, lots of the different programs that have existed to sop up that surplus. Uh, school food is one of those programs. Public Law 180, Boring uh, Food Aid is another uh, one of those. Uh, things such as the ever normal granary to deal with the uh, temporary surpluses and fluctuations which you can manipulate prices. Uh, lately, uh, it's things such as biofuels, uh, for instance, that are a good way to sum up that additional productive uh, potential. And there's many other examples we go through, but as I mentioned, that's not the objective here. My objective is just basically to say that we've been manipulating the agricultural economy intentionally uh, since at least the 1930s, and the whole thing was a, the environment was a federal creation dating at least to Lincoln. To make the point that we have made the food system that we have, we have made the rules. Uh, it, it is not like when you talk about thermodynamics and there are two governing laws of the universe, incontrovertible, undeniable, everything has to operate by those two laws. That doesn't apply at all to the agricultural system. Now, uh, what I'm going to skip to here is that when it became clear that we were producing way more than necessary and the greater thoroughness, that greater efficiency that Lincoln was appealing to, uh, early in the 1960s there was an episode where uh, Kennedy actually convened a number of the nation's business leaders to talk about how you deal with the surplus productivity. And they pointed out, well, what you do with surplus productivity is that you reduce the productive capacity. In any industry, that's what you do. You don't produce more than you need. And so there was a concerted effort, a concerted recommendation at least, and polytene efforts to reduce the number of farmers on the land because we didn't need that number of farmers because we had excessive production. And so um, here's another way in which you deal with surplus. You make free trade accords. We'll come back to this particular story in just a bit. And you realize we're just skimming in a very unjust way um, uh, topics that could keep us occupied for an entire semester uh, discussing. But I basically just want to give you the bird's eye view that we've been tinkering with the way that the system works. We're not obligated to any particular set of norms regarding how the agricultural system works. Because if we made it the way it is, we can remake it in a different way. Back to the theme of creating a utopia from a dystopia. But I've only talked about how the system appears to be utopian because we have all this political economic power. So what is the discourse that we can get into here? So we're gonna have to get into, uh, I'll try to make this as tall as possible. We'll try to get into a little bit of the ground in here. Um, so we learned to do agriculture in places like this. Uh, there's still a few small bands of folks that are not agricultural on the planet, but by and large, the conversion is taking place. It's taken 10,000 years. Now, it took a very long period of time. Not everyone became agricultural 10,000 years ago, but we learned how to do it in places like this. You recognize it as a river delta. Here, hydrogeology essentially has been mining a very large region, a watershed. It's been mining it for sediment, the minerals, and the organic detritus uh, in that large watershed, and has been concentrating in a particular place to create what we call fertility. Now what agriculturists are, by definition, are obstinate folks who refuse to recognize what a biologist would call the natural carrying capacity of any ecosystem. Because if you actually just lived according to the natural carrying capacity of a system, you would be a hunter, you would be a gatherer. But agriculturists say that they're not satisfied with that. Their population numbers are going to be greater than that primary productivity would allow in any particular ecosystem. But farmers are not magicians, you know, it isn't that they know something about thermodynamics that nobody else knows. Essentially, what we as agriculturists do is exploit this phenomenon. Now, it's easier to appreciate it when you see it from overhead, something like this. This is the Coachella uh, Valley in Southern California. You see this nice alluvial fan, which literally is the displacement of what used to be those smooth hills that have now been eroded that you see in the background. So literally, hydrogeological processes have been doing a lot of thermodynamic work and wearing down all that material, turning into fine particles, soil, minerals that turn into nutrients for plants, and that water all slows down in that alluvial fan, and that's where you can have your agricultural fields and capture that concentration of resources. Even to the modern day, you can see that that's still where this particular uh, agricultural area is. So this is runoff agriculture. It's the model, the basic model of agriculture until modern times. So for 10,000 years, the people have began to do this in the fertile crescent, and the Nile River Delta, 
This was basically what they were doing. Now notice, you can continue to operate in this way as long as those hills are there to wear down. Where the human beings are there to exploit that, this process is going to be going on. So early agriculturists just interposed themselves in that natural process. They didn't accelerate it, now they did manage it. Because for instance, what you would do at the bottom is to create berms and other structures to slow down the flow of the water so it wouldn't be destructive and it would actually deposit the sediment and you could farm in those uh, areas. So what we do in modern times is a version of this, but of course we just don't wait to happily find a river delta or an alluvial fan. We create our virtual alluvial fans these days, namely those places where there are sufficient productive resources and we need, need to complement with a few that may be missing in a particular area of <laughs> California. <coughs> so here we have an example of something from northwestern, uh, northeastern Colorado. And here's an example of what uh, we mean by a virtual alluvial fan. So there are very good soil resources there, but in order to stoke the productivity from, remember the corn produced without any input around 30 bushels per acre prior to the Second World War, so we're now in that particular area, it isn't unusual at all to produce 280 bushels per acre, just as it is in this particular county, that would be fairly common here. And so our virtual alluvial fan now looks something like this. And it takes tremendous energy in order to be able to command the resources of the planet and concentrate them in the staging area where we now perform uh, agriculture, where the, there is hydrogeology aiding us. And notice that we now cannot observe that this would occur naturally whether human beings were there or not. Now we're essential to this process. We're diverting flows of materials, water, energy in order to make this possible. All of it highly intentional. Um, now, uh, this may look like a nice bucolic scene, and, and again, I, I hate to do this to you, it's very cruel, I apologize ahead of time, it won't last very long, I just want to give you a little bit of an insight into the way that an agronomist would see uh, something like this that differs from the way that you might see it, say, when you're going through in the, uh, in the van with your family, and that is that that canopy that you saw there for an agronomist is a way to distribute in three space trillions and trillions of what used to be independent blue-green bacteria and are now organelles characteristic to plants. It looks something like this, and they're the basic machinery of photosynthesis. They need to be distributed in three space, as many as you can, as densely as you can, to capture sunlight in that staging area where you bring in all these materials from all over the world in order to stoke their production of triosis, the basic building blocks of glucose, the sugars that then turn into protein, starch, uh, and everything else that becomes that plant. It's cellulose, it's fibers, and so on. Now think about this. You should visualize that there's plumbing collected, connected to this. The biologists know that we've got xylem going in, phloem coming out, and that plumbing is essentially providing the inputs for the photosynthetic reaction. You need water as one of the inputs for the photosynthetic reaction. We need sunlight, and we need carbon dioxide, which is in the atmosphere. So the, the carbon dioxide will be there but the water needs to be provided. So you can imagine that there's going to be plumbing in order to provide that. And that plumbing is not just internal to the plant. Now we've got a global system in order to be able to produce that. Here I've described in California, it is the runoff uh, from the Sierras that, that is actually providing that. And then the output has an equivalent uh, analog. So I promise you that we wouldn't uh, sit on that a whole lot, but I did want to remark on, on the following. When we go and take a look at an image like this, again, now what you need to imagine is that that virtual alluvial fan that I described actually means to be able to drive this photosynthetic reaction to the right, as any chemist would tell you, you want to maximize the production of the carbohydrates on the right of that reaction, what you need to have is unlimited amounts of the reactants on the left side of that uh, reaction. And so, if this needs to an agronomist, let me just translate for you what a canopy like that means. That particular canopy embodies something like about 12 tons of elemental carbon. So remember, that's coming from the atmosphere. It's sopping up that directly from the air. Um, every one of those plants, and there might be 35,000 of them in a field like that, contains a gallon of water at any given time. And it's not the same water. It's cycling through that plant to maintain it erect and to keep it cool. And it also will contain something about 900 pounds of elemental nitrogen, one acre of, of that particular canopy. It'll contain something about 600 pounds of elemental potassium, 
230 pounds of elemental phosphorus. About 30 pounds of elemental, say, manganese, any number of the minor nutrients. Now, that amount can be provided by the soil. But the 200, 300, 900 pounds that I described, that's what we're reshaping and taking from all over the world and concentrating on this particular area in order to stoke that tremendous productivity that we've described. It's a major logistical accomplishment. So obviously, anyone who sits and thinks about this for a little bit, and as a matter of fact, I mean, we, we could bore you forever with this, you say, how long can we keep that up? Well, so the phosphate and the potash are coming from places like this. So this is a potash mine, the Marenzi mine in eastern Arizona. Um, this is a phosphate uh, mine from a part of the world where this material is particularly plentiful in northwestern Africa. This happens to be Togo. The answer to the question, how long can we keep that up, is anywhere from about 50 years to about 350 years, depending obviously on several variables. The biggest one is how quickly China will go online, falling all over itself to do exactly what we have done with our food system. Namely, the more quickly McDonald's blossom all over the countryside with the beef supply chain, the wheat production and supply chain, and everything that we know is behind that, the potato supply chain, everything that makes that possible, you know, tomato supply chain. The more quickly that comes online, then the smaller those numbers that I just described. Now, this is particularly important. We can figure out ways that we can use nitrogen and carbon more than once. There are global cycles of these materials. We're not doing a particularly brilliant job of that because we're not being intentional uh, with that at the moment. But you can't do that sort of stuff for potassium and phosphate at the moment because the rate at which this stuff gets deposited, say, in ocean bottoms, and then geological processes and lift ocean bottoms to the top, where then we might have to come by and mine them, let's just say that's outside of the geological span of time that matters to us. And so for our, all intents and purposes, for us, it's true that we can't make this stuff. We have to figure out how to use this stuff more than once, which in that virtual alluvial fan that I described is not the way that we're set up to operate. Our system is very linear at the moment. We'll, we'll see some evidence of that in just a little bit. And of course, we get the energy to transport this stuff all over the place and transform it from activities like this. So this is an anhydrous ammonia manufacturing plant. Uh, these plants do something that some bacteria know how to do. They take atmospheric nitrogen, very unreactive, and under very high temperature and pressure conditions, which we have to supply through natural gas, they will actually fix that non-reactive nitrogen and create anhydrous ammonia, which is the fertilizer of preference throughout the entire Midwest and for corn production because it's very compact, uh, easy to manage, you get very high fertilizer value out of it. Um, but it requires a lot of energy, whereas the bacteria that know how to do this, we do this at soil temperature. This is a separate story. But we know how to manage those bacteria, if we would. And so I'll come back to that, sorry. So how long can we keep this up? Well, we can keep this up for as long as there are places like this, where we can extract oil and the natural gas that is the byproduct of that is available for us to potentiate the processes that I described. This is a tricky number to get a hold of. Because, of course, when we first started to do this, the stuff would literally jump out of the ground at you. You have to get out of the way. Whereas now, you have to expend a lot of energy, very high technology, at very high environmental risk, which we don't value. Uh, there's headlines right now in the news all about that story in order to get at that more difficult to extract oil. But there's evidently tremendous deposits of that more difficult to extract oil out there that we're just beginning to uh, get a grip upon. But there's the answer to that question. As long as we are able to extract fossil fuel, so we're not depending on cur current energy uh, impacting the planet, uh, then this process can go on. Now, there's tremendous energetics in the system just as I've described it. So for instance, an agronomist would look at that canopy that I just described. Uh, so we know the photosynthetic flux density at the surface of that canopy. The corn canopy is a nice deep canopy that can quench all of that light by the time that you get to the bottom. We know how to convert <coughs> the photosynthetic flux density through a conversion ratio, basically the quantum requirement of that canopy, to know how much sugar we can produce. Uh, about 82% of that light can be used to drive that photosynthetic process. About a third of the sugar that's produced is respired away, so we get to work with about 66% of it. Half of that 66% of it goes to produce root matter, the other half is aerial uh, material. Half of that in a corn plant goes into the grain that we actually harvest off of the field, which actually represents a leak from all of the resources that we've invested into that particular field. That needs to be replenished. At least that amount needs to be replenished. 
That's what agronomists refer to as the harvest index of 50, which is, as I've described to you, highly inaccurate figure. It's actually 25% of what exists there is root growing and aerial matter is being lost from that fuel in that way. It must be replenished, at least that amount. So an agronomist would see it that way, we have to be thinking of where the materials are coming in order to be able to stoke the productivity. And we know that we are utilizing those resources that are way greater uh, than they're actually being created in the, created in the case of some of the essential mineral uh, materials. And of course, water is very well known in the state as uh, uh, the most limiting and cultural input the uh, world over, uh, fresh surface water. Now, I mentioned earlier that we come back to the story of why this is possible, and this is the story. I know that what it looks like is a graph of the growing population of the United States and how it redistributed from primarily rural to primarily urban. I know that's what it looks like. There's a cost that was built here, uh, in the 1930s. So now the majority of us are urban, and we can do exactly what I repeated to you two or three times at the top of the story. We can just eat when we want. But we can do that because of this. So an economist would look at this same thing and say, ah, that's the explanation. That's economy of scale. So none of us individually would be able to justify the $300,000 combine that's required to harvest the corn and combines lots of different operations in order to produce clean grain to the uh, elevator where it is sold and redistributed uh, locally. But when we distribute those costs among all of us, then it is possible to utilize these very powerful technologies in order to do uh, what I just described. So here's the outcome, this tremendous surplus that I've described. And this is not to be forgotten. You know, So at every point that we go through here, let's remind ourselves that we're talking about plenty, not want. Tremendous success story of producing a lot. Not only that, way more than we need, to the point that we have to ask, what are we going to do with the excess stuff that we produce? Because we know how to produce more stuff. So we <coughs> must find a way to use the excess stuff. So uh, in the Midwest, the, the story looks like this. And what I want to do is to guide you through what will seem sort of like a, a version of um, Bill Murray's movie, Groundhog Day, in that we'll actually look at this several different ways. So um, this is the story of how the grain is produced and transported away to a, a river mouth in the Gulf, where then the world has access to it. And the farmers in this part of the world are justifiably proud, and they can look at you straight in the eye and say, I am one of the most productive agriculturists that this planet has ever known. And they are absolutely right. And that's because they're part of this huge logistic system that I've described. Now, let's borrow the jargon of engineers who tell us that any system is a set of component parts working in coordination to produce a specified end. So here's this specified end when seen through the eyes of that grain farm who's seen corn and soy in the Midwest. But now let's just use different eyes and talk about exactly those same parts, working in coordination exactly in the same way, but also producing other ants, not just those, those particular ants. So <coughs> these same parts, working in this particular way, are also the most efficient way that we have ever come up with in order to transport huge amounts of sediment from the entire Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi watersheds and deposit them in a very concentrated area at the mouth of the Atchafalaya Basin in the Gulf, where, in essence, the nutrients that are transported together with that sediment enrich uh, that water in such a way that there are algal blooms, among other phenomena, that make it impossible for aerobic organisms to live normally in that layer of water. You can see exactly how far that reaches. This is a picture from Nancy Ravelet of Luncombe, uh, the Louisiana Marine, uh, Marine Consortium, University Marine Consortium. Um, temperature uh, shifts because there are different spectral properties there. And so the entire ecosystem is dramatically altered by this economic activity upstream. To the tune of, depending on what year you're measuring, 30 to $90 million that it costs shrimpers who are no longer able to exercise a viable economic activity uh, in this area. And this is tremendous work. You know, if you, if you just think, if we have to use excavators to do this same amount of work that hydrogeology is doing, because in essence, we're loosening surface soil throughout these entire watersheds, you can see how much work this actually represents. And uh, because of the fact that we can actually track the source of uh, nitrate and phosphorus that are flowing from these fields, we pretty much understand this story. So that's one example. Let's take a look at exactly the same part, working in exactly the same way, look at them in different eyes. So you can actually say very accurately 
this very same system, with all these same parts, interacting in exactly the same way, are also a very efficient mechanism to displace rural farmers from southern Mexico and Central America and relocate them around meatpacking plants throughout the Midwest. So I told you when we talked about the North American Free Trade Agreement that we'd come back to that particular story. That's a, a way of essentially utilizing, in theory, the comparative advantage of the three countries of North America. Uh, and Mexico being the most economically backward country of the three, the idea was that if you provided trade, you would create industries, which would be sources of employment. So you could take poor rural citizens and displace them from agriculture. That was intentional. Because after all, how is Mexico going to compare with what we have just described here? Why even try? That was the, the government's uh, philosophy. So let's just trade for agricultural <coughs> products from the greatest agricultural machine that has ever been on the planet. It's our neighbor. And we will manufacture products. And you may be wearing some of those. You may be sitting on some of them. And the radios in your cars were manufactured in that, that particular way. And the notion was, in order to avoid a lot of pain in doing this, let's spread it out over 14 years, which was done. 14 year period is over. And that dream did not materialize in exactly that same way. Farmers were displaced, but they were not absorbed by industry in their home country. And there was a tremendous demand, a tremendous sink for labor in this country. And so, when you look in the back of the, any restaurant, when you actually talk with the folks that are cleaning the toilets at your hotel, and when you drive by any field and observe who is picking the fruits and vegetables, or when you eat any meat, you're actually benefiting from the labor of folks like this. And again, it's exactly that same system working in exactly that same way that's producing these results. So they are very efficient systems, very powerful to do all kinds of things. Here's another way, one more example. The leading causes of death in the United States are these 10. Four of them are incontrovertibly related to the way in which we eat. And they are thoroughly preventable. You change the way in which you eat, and you will not die from cardiac disease. You will not become obese and develop diabetes. You will not become hypertense. And there are certain cancers, notably cancers of the lower bowel, that you will not express if you change the way that you eat. Thoroughly preventable. So of those 10 leading causes of death, here's another consequence of this very plentiful system that allows us to have whatever we want, whenever we want. So, you can see what I mean when I say that there is cause to think about a food dystopia. In other words, you know, the, in the best tradition of dystopic science fiction, you take things that look to be really good, and all of a sudden you realize that there's a horrible scenario that no one intended, yet is actually a reality. And here's one way of visualizing this. These young gentlemen were photographed in a McDonald's in London. Obviously, they're too young to have made any decisions for their, themselves. And yet they're already a reflection of the environment in which they live, which we can visualize as a food matrix. It's made up of their caregivers, their parents. It's made up of the schools where they're provided food and develop their first ideas about what good food is. It's made up by the reward systems that we give to incentivize good behavior, punish bad uh, behavior. It's made up by the advertisement environment that we see when we go to movies or turn on the Saturday cartoons. And so that complex matrix is what's actually making the decisions for these folks and producing uh, results like the ones that you see here. You know that diabetes, uh, among many other diseases, here we see clearly metabolic disease and obesity, um, is essentially presenting in children when it did not used to present until we were adults. The amount of time that it takes now to accumulate all of the causal agents that result in this now is foreshortened. And it foreshortens our life. And that is entirely uh, preventable. And it's a result of the model that we created, again, totally different reasons uh, than the creators would have told us. The creators told us and actually had in mind that they were addressing our convenience, our desire to pay less, uh, our desire to eat tasty food. And so they explored all of those things and optimized them. Um, you know, they created what in the industry they call the bliss point, which they can define specifically for different types of food. And furthermore, we have an environment where because of the fact that we're producing too much of the wrong stuff, not enough of the right stuff, there's all kinds of distorted decisions that we make. Even the best of us, if you determine that you don't want to eat in a way that produces those four preventable causes of premature death, you're fighting the food system. You know that. You can't go to an airport or lots of different places and eat in a way that uh, would be helpful. And so let's, uh, to see this, let's take a visit to McDonald's. So here's a clandestine picture. Very, a very recent vintage, so it's up to date. 
And um, you've all been in this situation, you know, so you walk up, you get at the end of the line, you're training up to look at that. And so the decision, because there's pressure, you know, there's people behind you. And, you know, is it going to be number three and number six, what's it going to be? And so you're looking at a few uh, variables up here, but, but take a look at this. You can get a double quarter pounder with cheese. Um, for $4.69, or you can get the meal, the works, with fries or with Coke. You know, who am I telling? You're all experts in this. <laughs> for $6.89. Okay? Or look, you can get two cheeseburgers. The full meal for $5.29. So that's one choice that you have. Now let's say that you're being virtuous and your problem is you're caught in this place because you're in a hurry. You know, there's food, food all around, nothing to eat, and you're going inside trying to figure out what you can extract that's edible and helpful for you in the McDonald's. Now actually, it's a bit unfair to them because this is actually one of the chains that has tried to do many things right. But you know, bear with my example here. Here's the choice that they give you. So then you shift over to the next panel over, ah, the salads. Great, relief. <laughs> and then you look at that, and you can get a Southwest salad for $5.89, and look at the amount of food that that is. Or you can get a Caesar salad for $4.69, and all of a sudden you're sitting there saying, okay, that's not the full meal there. So now I can get for the same amount or less two cheeseburgers or this big you know, stack of meat, and the full meal with fries and Coke. It's anti-American to buy the salad, pay more for less. <laughs> So you have no choice. You feel like an idiot if you're standing up there making that decision. And this is just a microcosm of the entire food system because we produce too much of the wrong stuff, not enough of the right stuff. And remember, it doesn't have to be this way. We know better. We made it the way that it is. But clearly, not intentionally, that has to be acknowledged. At the same time, it is a totally different thing to talk about having, having created a system that we did not intend than it is to know the system that we've created and protect it, defend the way that it is. That is a totally different thing. In the best of American tradition, that needs to be criticized and rebuilt. And I'll tell you why it's in the best of American tradition here in just uh, a little bit. That's uh, creating the, the food utopia bit of this. So the results I've mentioned to you already, actually we feel in our pocketbook. So this is the cost of diabetes, this is the cost of obesity, this is the cost of cardiovascular disease, which is going to kill the majority of us if we keep eating the way that I've just described. We're manufacturing the way in which we're going to die. And it's important to us because right now our nation is living through several different crises, but one of these is a fiscal crisis. And let's take a look at this and how it's related to that. So uh, we all, you know, if we just pay attention to the news, are painfully aware of basically how close to the bone we are in terms of actually getting to the best efficiencies available in the federal budget. In essence, there are these five big chunks. Uh, each one of them in the neighborhood of about 718 to about 798 billion dollars, each of them. And you see that healthcare accounts for 21% of that, more than defense. Now these figures obviously prior to sequester, that, that story has yet to develop here. Um, significant proportion of that healthcare cost goes into programs such as Medicare and Medicaid which are cost largely for maintenance of long-term chronic disease related to the way in which we eat. Hypertension, obesity, diabetes, cardiac disease. So we bear some of that personally, and we see it this way, but some of it is a cost that we all bear through programs like that. And so you can see why it is that uh, physical conservatives would look at expenses like that and realistically ask the question, why should all of us be paying for costs like that? And by the time we get to this point, we've paid to subsidize the system the way it is right now. We indemnize and secure our farmers to minimize their risk so that they will be as productive as I described. That's an investment. We've created the research arm, this institution, USDA, RS, and this institution, and many others like it. So we've paid for all of that. So we subsidize the productivity. We clean up the environmental consequences. We dredge the Mississippi. We dredge the Missouri. And then we help to pay collectively to maintain the long-term chronic disease that results from that agricultural system giving us this food system. By this time, we've paid for it three times. You can see why you can legitimately get angry over something like that. And let's take a look at this story here, because you might be saying to yourself, but yeah, it's cheap. It's the most productive safest, most affordable food system in the world. Well, now look carefully at that title. This is a little bit of sleight of hand. It's sort of like my saying to you, I'm fast. You know why I'm fast? 
I'm fast because I can run in eight minutes. What's missing? <laughs> so, that's the sleight of hand. Now, I'm not saying it's intentional, but when you hear that figure, we in the U.S. spend less than 10% of our income in order to eat as well as anybody in the entire planet, that's what's missing. So to get a small quotient, you know, you need a small numerator or a big denominator or both of them. So which is it? Well, let's have a look. Here's income growth in the United States. And it looks like that. And so what that means is that when you look at the actual, the absolute cost of food in the United States, so these are normalized for inflation for that period of time there, you see that it's actually been fairly constant at around that level. And that what we really mean when we tell that story is how rich we are. So you could also legitimately say, you know, we are one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So we can really take it to the food system. Which is really what the story is, as I've described, the great political power. So let's look at it this way. So here's a graph that shows that. You know, here's the average family income in the United States. Here's the percentage that goes to food. Here's that same story for a few other countries. And while this populates, let me tell you that these are figures that are standardized to FAO nutritional standards. So you can read this as saying, what does it take to eat the healthful diet recommended by FAO? You can see that there's plenty of places in the world where they're way more efficient at providing the nutrition that we need for next to nothing compared to what it costs in the United States. But remember what you're paying for in the United States. We'll illustrate this uh, in just a little bit. There's lots of ways of looking at this story. Um, so here is that percentage translated in actual dollars to make the story easier to understand. So in Kenya, you can eat to FAO standards for $243. In India, you can do that for $217. Best I've ever eaten in my whole life. You know, lost 50 pounds. Uh, became the healthiest yeah, I've ever been in my whole life. It was a month spent in India where I tried hard to spend more than a dollar a day. I tried hard. I had budgeted for it, and I couldn't. The most tasteful, <laughs> healthful food I've ever had. And here's one of the reasons for that. But you know, in India, there's two food systems. I can't eat that way. I can also walk into McDonald's. Both of them exist. And they're both in competition, in direct competition. And that is the, the same story here. And where we replace that traditional system and leave no choice, where you have to walk into either the grocery store, the supermarket, or the fast food restaurant, but you don't adjust the income, and you're manufacturing hunger, perversely, but you're manufacturing hunger. So here's another result of this particular system. And remember, the story is surplus, to the extent that by the USDA's own standards, 40% of what we produce just gets thrown away. And you know how that happens. Um, you know, you go to the supermarket, you see a nice bunch of broccoli, you see some nice bananas, you get them all home, you get busy, you don't eat them, they turn brown, they go into the trash can. And we don't even think about it. And look at what it means. So for instance, 488, uh, or $4,880 is what the absolute figure would be for the United States. So take 40% of that. That means that in Kenya, easily, four families could eat for the amount of food that we throw away. Or here's another way of visualizing that. Your trash can eats better than families in India or Kenya do. Your trash can. So remember the story that I keep repeating. It's a story of surplus. It's a story of producing too much. Okay, so, producing too much. Of the wrong stuff, not enough of the right stuff. And the system says, Here's $1.3 trillion that says, you can't change me. This is the profit motive. This is the structure that's in place that benefits from the way that the system is at present. You don't need to impute evil motives to people. You just need to impute the profit motive. The way this system works, I mean, there's machinery that knows how to take certain kinds of grain and turn it into certain kind of bread. If you want to change that, that's expensive. So we create this legacy structure that is going to be inertia. So there's $1.3 trillion that says this is not going to change. And you know very well the way that this is distributed. The farm value on average is 19%. You know, the amount of processing that you do to what you're selling off the farm affects what end of that 19% you're on. And when you put it against that value chain that I showed you earlier in this much more simplistic uh, cartoon, it actually stacks up this particular way. So you can see nobody's cheating anybody. The dollar is distributed fairly. 
because the majority of the effort in this global logistical system is in getting you that edible bite within desire's reach. Those are the folks that are getting the majority of the dollar because what you're paying for for your food is incidental. Your nutrition is totally incidental to the story, if you get it at all, because part of the story is you're not. Um, because what you're really paying for is the convenience. The egg production is just one of the inputs into that, but you're paying for somebody else to take care of all of the details at your table and to take care of what you leave behind when you walk away. So how do we create a utopia out of this? What I'm going to argue is that we have a food system that is a tremendous success story for another time. And at present, we have different needs. And the future will have different needs, and that's the food system that we need to recreate. And you don't need to redo everything that I've just described. There's a few key things about this system that we need to change in order to get to this food utopia. Now, it would be nice if we could just go to the central office of the food system and talk to people there and say, look, we have this suggestion. <laughs> but, you know, there is no such office. There is no central office of the food system. Um, although, there are a few key people to talk to. So, concentration in this system Actually, if you're an economist, the archetypal, the prototypical examples that you would want to show for concentration would come out of this particular industry. So in the least concentrated industry of big-scale agriculture, in the feed industry, the concentration is 44%. And by the way, I should explain, this is you know, where you measure how much of the business is in the hands of the top four uh, players. So in the feed industry, that's 44%. As you climb up the concentration ladder, you know poultry processing, hog processing, you get to the top, to beef processors, that's 82% of that business is concentrated in four producers. So you actually do have some key people that you can go talk to. You know, on both fingers of your hands, there are some people that you can talk to, and you can talk to them either in their offices at Concentra, or you can talk to them when they serve their four or eight years at the USDA regulating their company. <laughs> <laughs> because this is actually what it looks like. And so, for instance, you saw Roger Vici from Monsanto did his turn serving as director at NIFA. Uh, you see that Islam Siddiqui served at Monsanto and was also the ag negotiator uh, uh, in the first administration for Obama. Uh, the Secretary of State, Mrs. Clinton, uh, was actually legal counsel for the board of Monsanto. I'm thinking just one company here to give you an example. Total revolving door example. But you know it's not the only one. I said that you know, on both fingers of your hands you can talk to the majority of this industry. And they have addresses, you can talk to them. And so let me propose what we would need to do for food utopia. And I, I want to do this by giving you an illustration. So I was um, born and raised in Mexico. I came to the United States when I was a teenager, so I was fully baked. And uh, so that means that it still happens to me that I will see the U.S. through the eyes of this Mexican teenager that was seeing things for the first time uh, when I came. And let me tell you something about Americans that I noticed immediately. And I still, every once in a while, just rises up and slaps me in the face. It's like the, the key characteristic of an American. And it is an American is never happy, never satisfied. You know, you just painted the house, and you're walking away looking at it, and already you're saying, ah, next time, this is what I'm going to do. Or you just did an addition, you just put up a porch, and before you sit down in the rocking chair and sip your lemonade and enjoy the crazy thing, you're saying, ah, didn't think of this. So next time, this is what I'm going to do. So in this dystopia that I've described, where good people, for all the right reasons, did some wrong things, it seems to me like it's very clear that the system has licked productivity. We know that. The system has licked scale because we're not all going to be producing our own food. Those are good things. But now the system needs to be improved. It needs to address sustainability. It needs to address fairness. And it needs to address health. And we all have an interest in that. There can't be any more American thing to do than to fix that system. And we know how to do that. So let me speak to you as an agricultural scientist. The system is a set of components working together in coordinated fashion to produce a particular thing. We replaced a lot of natural parts in the system that I've just described for you. In very complicated ways, the systems analyst refers to that as recomplication, where we have a system that is more complicated by degrees than it needs to be. So I'll give you just one example. I, I uh, teased you uh, about it earlier on. This is biological nitrogen fixation. 
Um, we know some of the ways in which the bacteria that do this trick do that. And, and probably all of the key tricks in biology, and in agriculture in particular, are ultimately bacterial tricks. Photosynthesis is a bacterial trick. Nitrogen fixation is a bacterial trick. Actually, what makes us possible is complicated aerobes is a bacterial trick because we appropriated uh, thermophilic bacteria extreme files and made them into mitochondria in our body. They make us very efficient at utilizing oxygen, which used to be a toxin in the environment. And so now we're possible because we can extract almost all the energy available in glucose molecules. So when you take a look at what bacteria need to do, you don't necessarily need to understand how they do it. We know some of the story of nitrogen fixation. So um, for instance, there's leg hemoglobin that's involved. We know that there's a function in which you sequester oxygen so that the site of nitrogen fixation is essentially um, anaerobic. So you remove competitors and you're essentially manipulating electrons. You're micromanaging the chemical redox reaction that takes place. But we don't need to understand it. We know the plants that couple with the specific rhizobia that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. So the type of uh, agricultural system that I'm describing is one that would use natural parts wherever those natural parts are available, which means we need to have people well-versed and knowledgeable in how those knowledgeable parts work. So that instead of walking up to a field and asking the question, have I applied my roundup on schedule, you're walking up to the field and you're saying, okay, so where's the carbon for the microbes that I need to fix my nitrogen so that then my crop can make? And how am I going to rotate crops so that I continue to provide the organic matter that is required in this soil so I don't need to be buying expensive fertilizer year upon year and being dependent on that energy extractively, linearly, exhaustively. So it's a simple story a biodiverse system depending on knowledgeable managers. And you know, there's this, this specious question about producing enough to feed the planet. I told you a story of surplus, and the reverse story is the story of waste. We do not need to be producing as much even now because even now when there are people that can eat the stuff that we're throwing away, that's not happening. Nobody can look you straight in the eye and say, if we produce more, we're going to fix that because that's not where the problem is. So the utopia that I'm talking about is about fairness, sustainability, health. And it means putting together the parts that we already know so that they work in a different way. We know how to do it. Knowledge is not limited. And so, what you need to do is to get to decision makers, and here's the beauty of my working in a place like the Union of Concerned Scientists. We're not confused about what we do. <laughs> Our pointy end aims directly at Congress. We are lobbyists. We want to persuade those people that they need to be doing things differently, just exactly in the same way that they did things in that timeline that I described to create the system that we have right now. We walk in there and say, we have a better idea. And we can't do it on our own. People like you, need to be saying the same sort of thing. Because the way that this system is possible right now, that those 10 people can actually walk through that revolving door and make up the rules that they want, is because nobody's aware of it. You just eat when you get hungry, you sit down and eat, and you walk away. And if you're making $50,000 a year, it's no sweat off your back. But if those folks can't make those deals in their offices, if there's light of day shining on them, and you're asking questions about sustainability, fairness, public health and the effectiveness of how you're spending public resources, that's a more difficult dialogue for them. And their responsibility is to listen to what you're saying. So in your own very district, this is who you talk to. John Garamendi, uh, there's this technicality. He wants to serve on more than two committees. So as soon as that's approved, he will be on the Agriculture Committee, the House Agriculture Committee. You need to talk to John. He says on his webpage, as a matter of fact, that he will be the champion for California's agricultural economy, that our farmers work hard and deserve a representative who rolls up his sleeves and gets to work for them. All very correct. Highest priorities are going to be promoting regional agricultural commerce and research. So we have to hold them honest to that, including our robust rice industry, fair enough, and our wide variety of specialty crops, and the research at UC Davis. And so this institution actually has a role as well in terms of contributing to the knowledge that will actually produce improved outcome for everybody that is a citizen in the country. We're all investors in this particular enterprise as we've seen in that historical timeline that I've described. So public investment should not turn into private benefit and much less into concentrated private benefit. So this is a story about democracy. Who earns the resources? 
food benefits. That's what makes it a political economy story as well. So here's what you can do on your phone, on your iPad, on your laptop. I see some of you have them out there. Talk to John. Just let him know that you're aware of some of the things that we've talked about here. Thank you very much. <laughs>